Namaskar. Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. I'm your host Sri Ayer. Today I have a brand new guest, Gautam R. Desi Raju, and we're going to talk about his book Bharat India 2.0. Before we get into the depth of the book, let's welcome our guest of the day, Gautam Ji. Namaskar and welcome to P Guru's channel. Namaskar, Sri Ayer Ji. I'm happy to be talking to you this afternoon. So, um, before we proceed uh, to talk about the book, a few words about uh, Sri Desi Raju. Gautam Radhakrishna Desi Raju was born on 21st of August 1952. Congratulations on turning 70, sir. You don't look 70. Thank you. And he was born in Chennai and is presently an honorary professor at the Indian Institute of Science. Bangalore. He is a recipient of several prestigious international awards such as the Alexander von Humboldt Pershing Prize and the TWAS Award in Chemistry and the ISI Medal for Science of the University of Bologna. He was president of the International Union of Crystallography between 2011 to 2014. As IICR president, he proposed to the United Nations that 2014 be celebrated as the International Year of Crystallography. He spearheaded this resolution and inaugurated the year in UNESCO Paris in January 2014, sharing the podium with Irina Bokova, the then Director General of UNESCO. So that is a very impressive resume. And uh, once again, we are honored to have you on our channel, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Sriji, for uh, having me on your podcast. I have watched your podcast for several years now and found it to be of great interest. And I'm glad that finally I have an opportunity to talk to you about my book, which by the by has only just, I think, come in. It has been released. It's the same Here picture that you've got behind you over there. Yes, and yes, yes. Yes, we all know what that is, yeah. Yes, I'm trying to reinforce the purpose of this document, uh, this book. Um, so let's let's take a quick look at the reason for why you wrote this book. The name of the book is Bharat India 2.0. And um, see, I, I read the synopsis and I have an idea of what uh, you've done, sir. And I want our viewers to go back to that period. 1947, August 15th, India gets its independence. Then Sardar Patel has a mandate. He has 556, take or give a few uh, kingdoms to unite and form a single uh, entity called uh, India. And, and uh, Jinnah was doing the same thing on the other side. So this was a task cut out. And then uh, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar, who was a PhD in law, uh, was tasked the job of writing the constitution. And to, in order to have a republic, India wanted to write its constitution. It started, I think, sometime in 47. And I think the, the date was fixed. I don't know about all the details. So kind of walk us through that because that leads to why you've written this book, sir. Well, yes. I mean, chapter one is uh, talks about the background, as you said. And chapter one is entitled India on 15th August 1947. Now, we knew we were getting independence from sometime in mid 46. It was not clear what form and shape this independence would take. And uh, certain documents or papers which are only slowly entering the public domain seems to indicate that even as late as 42, 43 and so on, the British might not have had any real wish or desire to leave India that soon. And there is even a report that maybe they would work towards something that looked like dominion status by 1960. So they were, I think the INA trials and the fact that soldiers were mutinying all over the country, I think this made them change their mind somewhat rapidly. 
This was, I believe, March 46 or something. Yes. So the yeah, so the Crips mission, which came to India again in mid 46, there was also direct action day, which was August 14th, 1946, which Jinnah organized in Calcutta. So the Simla conference basically led to a deadlock between the Indian National Congress and the All India Muslim League. With the result that basically it was decided that India would become independent. And again, it was not clear about partition, but partition was becoming now more and more inevitable. But my chapter one goes back even further. It actually goes back to 1896 which was the beginning of what might be called constitutional documents that were written from the Indian side and from the British side. And I talk about the lack of dialogue between the Indians and the Britishers. How the Britishers really wanted to cede as little authority as possible and the Indians wanted to gain as much as possible in terms of self-governance. Ideas about independence, dominion status and so on were very hazy, I would say, even by 1928 and so on at the time of the Motilal Nehru declaration and so on, which I described. So things were going on. You mentioned Patel. Patel came into the princely states matter only after 46 because you know there is another thing which is not really well known about the freedom struggle that uh, as far as the people participating in the freedom struggle were concerned they felt that it was it had largely to do with only the what was called British India the area which was directly under the administration of the British. About these princely states, 546 or whatever on the Indian side, or on both sides, I forget which, but uh, people didn't think too much about these princely states or what would happen to them when the British left. And there is this notion of what is called paramount sea. And the British kept threatening the Congress that uh, the Paramount Sea would revert to the princes when they left. They said that we are technically responsible only for British India. So if we go, that's what we are going to let go of. And it was here, I think, that Patel had a major contribution. And in fact, at the very end of chapter one, I have quoted a fairly long extract from Patel and where he emphasizes two points which were of utmost importance to what was in future going to become independent India. The first point had to do with the princely states. And he told the Britishers point blank that they would go and they were not going to worry about paramount sea. And he says, in fact, and this is in the, he said this in the constituent assembly. He said, you leave the princess to us. We will take care of them. You don't worry about what's going to happen to the princess after you go. And they agreed to that. The second point that Patel was able to ensure is that uh, and he says this also in the Constituent Assembly, that uh, the Muslims wanted undivided Punjab and undivided Bengal. And Patel again put his foot down and said that uh, these provinces were going to be divided. And this is the origin of Jinnah's phrase that uh, he had got a moth eaten Pakistan. So the original idea of the IUML was undivided 
Punjab and undivided Bengal and prior to Shyam Prasad Mukherjee's activities in 46, they also wanted Assam, which is why Assam was in such a delicate state throughout the Constituent Assembly. And another thing that people don't know, many people don't know, is that the Constituent Assembly was set up in mid to late 1946, that is before independence, before we knew that there was going to be partition. And the original membership included people from all over the undivided India. So there were close to 400 members in the beginning, which after 15th August 47 came down to slightly less than 300 because the people from the Muslim League and other places went across to Pakistan at that time. So that is really the background which I have recounted in chapter one. And I think it's important to know that, I mean, the how the constitution was written is not central to the theme of the book, but it is very necessary background reading. And that's why I put it in chapter one. And I think I have described all these various constitutional documents, the Minto Morley reforms, the Montague Kemsford reforms, and the famous Government of India Act 1935. All these things from the British side had an important part to play in why our constitution was written the way it was written or why it was not written the way in which it was not written. So that is now for the readers of the book to start uh, digesting these matters and try to come up with uh, their own explanations and rationalizations. And in fact, that's I intend my book to provoke readers into wondering about why things happened and didn't happen the, the way you know it turned out. Um, Gautam ji, I have uh, had the pleasure of uh, talking to Padma Bhushan Awardee, Dr. Nagaswamy. And way back in 2018, in one of my conversations with him, he said, you know, we need to just throw away this constitution and write something new. And it should be based on Manusmriti. Manusmriti has everything that is needed to uh, rule and manage Bharat. And he started quoting to me various places where he had red stone inscriptions, how a particular king ruled, you know. And, and one thing he said, it didn't matter whether I went to as far east as Champanagari, which is Cambodia, modern day Cambodia, uh, and uh, even Thailand he has visited, and all the way down south, all the way west. He said, everywhere, any king of repute would always leave behind something about how he conducted the affairs of state. And he said, somewhere I would see the mention of Manusmriti. So, th so th I don't know if the uh, the writers of the constitution ever looked at that aspect, sir. In your research, did you find anything of that nature? The members of the constituent assembly, I think the Hindus at any rate, the vast majority of them, I do believe were deeply devout Hindus. I, their utterances and statements in the assembly, that is the stuff that is on record, certainly indicate that. And uh, so it's not that they didn't know about what Professor Nagaswamy has correctly told you. And uh, for example, Cambodia is a kingdom in the northwest, you know, present day Afghanistan, Herat, and all that. All right. And I emphasize, and that's why it's called, my book is called Bharat, because it is about Bharat Varsha. That land which is between the ocean and the mountain, which is the island of Jambu trees, where the children of Bharata reside. This is our civilizational space. And there were ways of governing this space, which I hope I have brought out. Chapter 3, for example, talks about the civilizational state. And Bharat Varsha is a civilizational state. So to illustrate those concepts, I first had to go get into what a nation state is which meant that I had to delve a little bit into European history, which is what I've done in chapter three. And I have also, I think, outlined a, 
slightly different idea from others who have written on this that there are actually two types of nation state depending on the situation in prevailing in Europe before and after World War I. So before World War I, there was one type of nation state. And after World War I, there was a much more stable variety of a nation state. I call these for lack of any other term. You know, scientists are very uh, good at naming things. I don't know whether people in other subjects do this, but I've called the pre-World War I situation as a metonic nation state and the post-World War I situation as an anti-metonic nation state. But whatever kind of nation state you talk about, Bharat is not one. Of that, let there be no doubt. And I think the fact that we were a civilizational entity was known to the members of the Constituent Assembly. I dare say even the non-Hindus. A couple of statements made by Christians and Muslims in the Assembly indicate that they too were well aware of the fact that Bharat is, you know, not, not a country like other countries. They knew that. But strangely enough, there is no mention, no acknowledgement even of this in the constitution. So when Professor Ramaswamy says the constitution needs to be thrown away, I mean, readers of my book will probably realize that I tend to concur with his opinion because the changes I have asked for are so many that it's practically like writing a new constitution. So what I'm saying is that the original plan itself being bad, then there is no doubt that whatever we try to do with the, with the best of intentions after that, it's never going to yield an optimum result because the original plan was not so good. And reasons why the the Constituent Assembly did not go back to the Smritis. At some point in time, I, in the book, I think maybe chapter 4 or something, I do quote uh, Sarvepali Radhakrishnan when he says that India is looking for a new Smriti. The greatness of Sanatana Dharma and I think the reason why it has lasted so long is that our ancients very cleverly put things down in the form of uh, Shrutis and Spritis. So the Shrutis are eternal, they are never changing and they deal with certain basic aspects of human nature which are never going to change. Whereas the Spritis have more to do with the period under consideration. So everything that Manu wrote in his time is not going to be valid today. More or less, if you were to look at it in another way, Sri Ayarji, the Shruti component of the Shastras would be the vision, vision. Whereas the Spriti component would be the mission, which changes from time to time. And I think by keeping these two apart, you see, Many of the problems of, I believe, the Abrahamic religions is that everything is put down more or less in a way that doesn't permit of any change. And they get themselves into inconsistencies because some of the things that were valid in uh, Judea of 20 centuries ago or Arabia of 13 centuries ago, the Shruti and Spriti of those religions were all put together as one and it was valid for that time. So what was going on in, in Judea 20 centuries ago and in Arabia 13 centuries ago may not necessarily be the most efficient way of going about things in the 21st century. And this is where I think Sanatana Dharma really scores. Because we have complete liberty to modify the Smritis, which I believe is going on. I mean, it goes on all the time. And uh, my book is, describes another way of doing this. 
and of course it brings in the idea of diversity which is totally different and new idea i believe the crux of the book is chapter 4 which talks about smaller states as a means of enhancing diversity and so on so we talk about professor nagaswami which is a great scholar by the way and i have heard some of his i've never met him but i've heard some of his presentations and so on i think he was absolutely right i mean why not we be honest enough and say that and i have described in chapter 5 how other countries important and rich republics today like france germany have not hesitated to change their constitution quite considerably over a period of 100 years so and i have said repeatedly to the point of i think exhaustion and maybe irritation to the readers that uh, our constitution is not a holy book that fell to us from somewhere so it is not something that needs to be worshiped it has to be something that needs to be looked at it's a, is it a good enough guide to take us through the very tricky journey we have to make in this time of the 21st century i mean it's not an easy time for any country in the world today will that constitution of 1950 is it a sure enough guide for us today i, I definitely feel no viewers um, the book is available in sapnaonline.com it's uh, sir if you could show the book for us excellent excellent amazon first post sapna uh, hindu e shop are at least four of the places that are selling it now and today um, you know i ordered this copy which has come to me in bangalore so i it has been gradually trickling down uh, shri ayer ji i think people in delhi were getting it 3 4 days ago and gradually i heard of people from raipur and lucknow and calcutta yesterday it was hyderabad today it's bangalore i think so it's coming down slowly trickling down it to <laughs> peninsular india but here it yes. is you know readers and uh, uh, it's available and it is in stock in these places so please go there buy it read it and let me know you know this is meant it's meant for young people it is meant to give feedback as i like to say very often in my scientific uh, writings and lectures is the minus neither the first word nor the last word i wouldn't dare to uh, you know claim either <laughs> of these things for this book wonderful sir and uh, we wish you all the best and success and hopefully you know this starts making people think i the younger generation is a lot more curious lot more asking why questions whereas you know uh, i could say my generation was guilty of just uh, you know listening and putting your heads down they were all told you know we were all told you have three professions that you should aim for and and the the order also was told first aim for a doctor if you can't become a doctor become an engineer if you can't become an engineer at least become a lawyer or something of that nature or bank so you need the third option change i think after 1969 banking became a much coveted profession and and so on and so forth but now there are many more vistas available avenues available for the younger generation and you also can see you know whatever the system that it is there clearly it doesn't work i mean i i can tell you there are so many ways uh, you know things are getting bogged down yet because of the inherent dharma dharma that exists within us as a people we kind of know this is right this is not right that is what is actually running the country sir this is my humble opinion i have uh, i'm staying in tamil nadu you understand what is going on here certainly certainly i mean uh, i talk about basic structure and how i describe basic structure uh, shri ayer ji you have said the same thing i have written that basic structure is something that should never be written down it should be something that is so inherently obvious to any indian you should not need to be a lawyer to understand basic structure it's what makes us all tick and uh, what makes us tick is dharma and dharma is supra religion it goes above religion eh? 
Yes, yes. Yes, and that is the essence of Bharata Varsha, which again comes back to what even the atheist Savarkar said. And uh, the fact that this dharmic component is simply not there. Tamil Nadu, of course, I have made several veiled references to that state in my book without mentioning it by name even once. <laughs> so, well, yes, I mean, I mean, yes, I think you can see that you see the funny side of it. And since I too have, I was born in Madras and uh, it was called Madras then. And uh, when I was born and uh, spent the first 10 years of my life there. And uh, my wife is from there too. And so I can say that uh, I know that state pretty well. I would feel certain aspects of it. And uh, I think people from there too ought to read my book. Yes, they and should. They should. They I should. think they should. I mean, because finally, you know, this is written by a person with no really vested interest. As I've written in the preface, I really stopped mentioning political personalities and parties after the emergency. Because I feel that emergency and before now has gone into the historical era. Anything after the emergency, I feel, is still current affairs. So <laughs> it is likely to, yeah, I, you know, what is happening um, with, uh, you know, some politician today, he might change his party next week and he'll be saying the opposite thing. So he, there's no point in too much in talking about today's politicians and today's political parties, except, of course, where it concerns certain things about the constitution. For yes. example, I, Manish Tiwari of the Congress has written very eloquently in many places about the uh, anti-defection law of 1985 and 1985. Yeah, no. 1985 was one third, and then they changed it again. Yes, yes, yeah. Correct. Uh, yes, yes. Shortly after Rajiv Gandhi became prime minister, so he talks about the fact that it was a, a law that was widely welcomed when it was passed. It was passed unanimously by parliament, and today, if you look back, you find that after 40 years or so. It is that law that more than anything else has spoiled parliamentary discourse in our country today. And it has led to all sorts of aberrations, distortions and very dubious behavior by our politicians. Also the mad craze to become ministers. See, a person from a ruling party who is not a minister practically becomes, you know, irrelevant with the anti-defection law. And so when there is a specific constitutional implication, then and then only have I talked about political parties, not otherwise, because this is not a political book. And uh, people who are trying to read this book to say whether is it right wing, left wing or whatever these wings mean, I don't think even right wing, left wing means too much today. Because India is a very different country. It, is, it doesn't subscribe very easily to this right-wing, left-wing labels yes, and yes. such, you know, uh, neat labels which the West has given us. Yeah. Absolutely true, Gautam Ji. This, see, this is the thing. There is dharma in, it, in us. We have grown up that way. It's there. We are breathing it, eating it. And some of us refuse to admit that that's what they are doing. I mean, is there ignorance? Uh, more so in countries like Pakistan, Afghanistan and, and Bangladesh and less so in India. But we do see a lot of these specimens, you know, hanging about. But, sir, this was a wonderful conversation and I didn't know what I was going into. Uh, this is the first time we are talking at length. We have just said hi, hi, bye, bye a few times, I guess. But it was my pleasure and honor to have hosted this conversation and I'm hoping that we will have more such conversations in the future. All the best to you, sir. Viewers, do buy this book. It promises to be wonderful. And um, you need to read some of these things because unless you understand where we went wrong, you will not be able to fix it the next time around. 
Definitely. It may not happen tomorrow. Constitution may not be rewritten tomorrow. But exactly. sl slowly but steadily, India is now beginning to look, look, this is not going to work. You know, that, that kind of the entire population saying something, no, this is not going to work anymore. In fact, we will look back at the Nupur Sharma incident 20 years from now, just like Shahabano incident. Nupur Sharma will be like one of those time markers. They say a day when India turned. I believe that's what is happening now. I could be wrong, uh, Gautam ji. And, uh, but the point I'm trying to make here is that this is a book worth reading. You should go back and read it many times because these are you know, very nuanced observations that Gautam ji has and his scientists at work trying to dissect this thing and say uh, this this is what it is this is how it needs to look at people have to look at it again challenge it see what can be changed and what should be changed the the allegory of you know using shrutis and smritis is excellent because they knew they knew some things had to be changed some things could not be changed that that's a beautiful beautiful uh, you know met metaphor that you have provided in this talk sir thank you very much once again and Viewers, please like, share and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget to click on the bell button for notification. An mm -hmm. honor having you, sir. Go ahead, sir. Small, small technical point, because many people who live abroad, uh, both uh, of Indian origin and otherwise, have been writing to me about getting hold of a copy of the book outside India. And this also includes, incidentally, Sri Ayerji, you know, foreigners who are my scientific colleagues, who are very intrigued by the fact that uh, somebody whom they knew so well as a scientist has written a book on the Indian constitution. So they too want to get hold of the book. It is not simply people of Indian origin. And right now I can say that uh, Sapna is the place where you can get the physical copy of the book in foreign countries, uh, but it is a little expensive, I would say. And uh, the Kindle version will come, uh, but uh, this may take also a month or two, I don't think. The other vendors, Amazon and Hindu, eShop and Flipkart, really don't promise to deliver the physical copy abroad. I don't know what readers like to do. I mean, I always like to read a book with, you know, flipping the pages and, you know, looking at things. Uh, because then you can go back and forth in, in ways that... And, and the feature of my book is that you can read each chapter individually, first, second or last. It's not a, it's not a book that you have to read in, in the order also. So, if you have any problems with getting the book. I mean, I don't know how many of your subscribers live outside India, Sri Ayanji, but uh, for those who are maybe uh, looking at this... About one in three, sir. About one, one in three. three. Means, one in three means I think they should either contact me or contact my publisher, Vitasta, and we will try to suggest. What many of them are actually doing, Sri Ayanji, is getting a friend who is visiting India to buy the book here and yes. take it back. Yes. Many people yes. are doing that actually. now. Yesterday, there was right. someone who is in the Republic of Ireland, who uh, you know, has somebody coming here and uh, the person has bought two copies and taking it back with them because they're yes. going there next week. Something like that. People are making informal arrangements. It's very easy to get in India, obviously. So right, right, this right, is just right. a technical point which I was going to end. Yes, yes. Thank yeah. you very much, sir. So, so yeah. Namaskar. You, sir. Namaskar.